I'd like to offer a warm welcome to you all and to thank you for taking the time to join us today for Baton Systems' third Pay21 show of the year. Today's show will be a mixture of interviews, demos, and insights into FX PVP, payments, and liquidity management. I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Bill Cohen, who's recently come on board as a senior advisor, where he will sit alongside Chris Giancarlo, with whom we spoke on the last show. I'm also joined in the studio by Jerome Kemp, who's recently taken on the role of president at Baton. Jerome will be talking with Bill later in the show about the Basel III Capital Framework and his thinking around today's emerging digital market infrastructures. Now, to get us underway, I'd like to hand over to our CEO and founder, Arjun Jayaram, for a company update. Hello, welcome to the third edition of Pay21. I'm Arjun Jairam, founder and CEO of Baton Systems. And it's my pleasure to open this show with you. I will spend just a couple of minutes talking about the progress that we've been making over a very busy and eventful summer. I will also be sharing our views on some industry themes that are emerging. On the customer front, we are excited to share that we've added more strategic tier one banks as users of our solutions for FX, payments, and collateral. Customer traction continues to grow as each new customer has integrated Baton into its core processes and moves billions of dollars daily across the platform for both cash and securities. As our products mature, we're able to demonstrate more proof points. We are seeing greater demand from new potential clients, a shortening of the sales cycle, as well as a shorter onboarding time per customer. I was recently shown some interesting data regarding our footprint that I would like to share with you today. The first, Baton has settled over $3 trillion in cash and securities since we first deployed our solution at our first customer site. The second, we have facilitated the settlement of over 15 million individual transactions so far this year over a broad range of currencies and security types. And third, we've had more than 99.99% uptime for our platform for all our customers. Now, regarding the product development, we continue to roll out enhancements to our collateral, our FX, and our payments products. On the collateral side, by the end of October, we will have integrated directly with nine of the largest global CCPs, providing our users with one consolidated source of real-time data with their individual margin calls and collateral on deposit. We also provide one entry point for the pledge, recall, and substitution instructions. This set of nine CCPs covers around 90% of the asset coverage by value of cleared collateral for all our customers. We also added connectivity to provide real-time data and on-demand settlements for three of the largest custody banks and CSDs. This allows our customers to achieve significantly faster security settlements. Our FX and payments products have also seen strong growth and our customers want us to increase the value further up the middle and back office stack. You all know how difficult it is to bootstrap a network with some of the largest and the most influential banks. Not only did we manage to do that, Baton today has a rule book on FX PVP that multiple banks have agreed to. This defines the operating rules around the shared workflows and settlement finality. Stay tuned on our FX settlement as we will be announcing some industry-defining news in just a few weeks. And now, let's talk about some industry trends. It has been an eventful three months in the world of payments. While crypto and digital assets continue to dominate the news, we should pay attention to some macro trends in the industry. I'd like to classify them into three broad areas. One, regulators call to action on FX risk. Two, central banks opening up the accounts to non-banks. And three, the crystallization of views around the bank of the future. Let's start with the first one. 
The recently released version of FX Global Code by the GFXC marks a significant change in the focus of elimination of settlement risk. This new code states that whenever practicable, market participants should eliminate settlement risk by using settlement services that provide payment versus payment or PVP settlements. And when PVP settlement is not used, market participants should reduce the size and the duration of their settlement risk as much as practical. This is the clearest call to action on this point that we have seen yet. As a response to this, we are seeing some of the largest FX banks actively looking at the full scope of their non-PVP FX settlements, be it for internal settlements or FX settlements across their various legal entities or for settlements with external counterparties. This is a problem that Baton solves today. We deliver FX PVP settlement with settlement finality or a very large set of currencies without the need for central bank accounts. This gives banks, for the first time, the option to use their existing facilities to settle with the security, certainty, and finality of PVP. On the second point, Baton has been in active discussions with multiple central banks. As many of you know, there is a fundamental problem in market structures. Central bank accounts are only available to organizations with a banking charter domiciled within a country. That leaves out many financial institutions and tech companies who need access to these type of accounts as well. We see a very welcome change from central banks finally taking action. This will take time as it will require legislative changes. But the emergence of digital assets and distributed ledger technologies and alternate assets has expedited the need for change at central banks. We think it will be a positive move to provide more parties with access to central bank accounts. Even with this, we think that many will continue to use correspondent banks and Nostro accounts to settle their effects. I told you in the past pay 21s that Baton has been focused on the top tier banks as they are epicenters or hubs for all types of settlements. As I mentioned earlier, each of our customers actively settles many hundreds of millions of dollars per day, and in some cases, materially more. Amongst other things, we've been in active discussions with our customers on the subject of digital market infrastructure. More specifically, we think about what a bank in 2030 will look like. A bank today primarily deals with currencies. If we were to fast forward to 2030, the spectrum of assets that a bank will settle will change materially. It'll consist of fiat currencies, central bank digital currencies, stable coins, traditional securities, digital security tokens, and crypto assets. We also think central banks, commercial banks, and CSDs will be open 24 by seven and will accommodate a broader range of account holders to include smaller banks and fintechs. And the third change that we are likely to see, most middle and back office systems will move to a cloud-based SaaS offering. The success of that SaaS offering is going to rely on a few things. Interoperability, reliability, extensibility. It goes without saying that these lie at the very heart of our design philosophy. The most influential banks are already working towards the bank of 2030. They're partnering with a very small set of companies like Baton Systems as the principal provider of rails and functionality that they will need. This is the world that Baton is planning along with you, our customers. You're guiding us and encouraging us to provide solutions to evolve the current reality toward the vision of a safer, more robust ecosystem for all market participants. This meant that we will have to bring in leaders who have scaled organizations and who have capital markets and banking in their DNA. Join me in welcoming Jerome Kemp to Baton Systems as a president. Jerome was one of my first customers. He's a mentor, an advisor, and a friend. Importantly for me and the board, he embodied our core value systems of integrity, trust, and hard work. I'm happy and humbled that Jerome Kemp has joined Baton Systems. Over to you, Jerome. Thanks, Arjun. This is a particularly meaningful and exciting Pay21 event for me as it's my first as Baton's president. 
It's been almost a year since I've been associated with Bataan, and even longer when I think about my interaction with Bataan as a client, and I am very proud to be leading the company, along with Arjun and the management team. As I said in my very first Pay21 appearance, Bataan is the vanguard of long overdue innovation in the asset movement and settlement space. We're replacing 20th century systems with the power, intelligence, and security of 21st century technology. We're partnering with clients to overcome the realities of prolonged settlement exposure, funding and liquidity challenges, and the need for more robust, verifiable, and transparent networks is an exhilarating experience for all of us at Bataan. Today, I'm very excited to introduce to you the new branding for Bataan Systems' revolutionary range of solutions. These solutions are transforming the processes we've come to accept as a status quo in the post-trade environment. We are moving from server-based, hardwired, inflexible infrastructures that suck up massive amounts of financial and human resources into fully digital market infrastructures. We are redefining what post-trade processing should look like, fully connected, friction-free, flexible, and transparent. Bataan gets to the core of the fundamental challenges facing actors in the marketplace today. With that, I am delighted to share with you the new branding for Bataan's suite of solutions that are revolutionizing the post-trade space. Today, I give you Bataan Core, Core Collateral, Core Liquidity, Core FX, and Core Payments, representing the key attributes of our solutions, collaboration, connectivity, and control, redefined. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Bill Cohen, Senior Advisor to Bataan Systems and former Secretary General to the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jerome. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Bill, today we're going to talk about the Basel III Capital Framework. You were one of the principal architects of, uh, of this regulation. What were the drivers of your thinking as you embarked upon the revision of the regulatory capital post-GFC? Well, uh, Jerome, regulatory capital certainly comprised the bulk of the reforms, but I, I, I always feel compelled to remind people that the entire package was immense and included non-capital reforms like the a liquidity standard, for the LCR, the liquidity coverage ratio, a funding standard, the net stable funding ratio, uh, important guidance we've provided on risk data aggregation and risk reporting, referred to as BCBS 239, large exposures, guidance on supervisory expectations, and, and a whole lot more. But you're, um, you're right, the thrust of the reforms uh, was regulatory capital. Uh, what was our thinking? Some of it was driven by the, the glaring inadequacies of the existing framework. And these were the reforms that we made were um, readily apparent and, and, and readily needed. Um, just the, the amount and the quality of capital. So more capital, which means a higher calibration, of the uh, required minimum ratios, uh, better quality, more um, better loss absorbing regulatory capital, guidance on securitizations, CDO squared, other trade, uh, traded credit products. Um, and some of the reforms were searing lessons from the global financial crisis, which provided uh, really important feedback. Just the, the entire credit risk framework um, the operational risk framework, certainly market risk, um, what people refer to as the fundamental review of the tr uh, trading book. Those reforms were built on enhancing the existing rules. Um, so that was, I wouldn't say easy, but at least there was something to work with already. A lot of the other reforms we made were uh, really new or novel. Uh, a leverage ratio, a leverage ratio had only been in existence in the US uh, and in Canada, uh, not in the rest of the world. Um, and this is a whole, a whole part of the effort to, um, to take a, a multiple metrics approach rather than just rely on a single um, measure like the risk-based capital ratio. Now we've got the leverage ratio, we've got liquidity and funding ratios, and uh, of course we've got the, um, uh, I hope, the new and improved capital ratios. Um, the whole system of buffers Capital buffers, for example, the capital conservation buffer, um, banks would be restricted from how much capital they can distribute in the form of uh, dividends, for example, or share buybacks if their capital levels fall below a prescribed threshold. Um, a counter-cyclical capital buffer, um, 
In theory, it sounds great, right? Banks build capital in good times. Um, for the inevitable downturn, they'll be able to draw on that capital uh, in less good times. So a lot of what we had done, um, were, it was driven by the global financial crisis. We were um, think, trying to think ahead, trying to make the, um, the framework future-proof, not fighting the last war. Um, and a lot of these things, Jerome, were really based on you know great theory and, and uh, academic research. But in, in many respects, we weren't particularly sure exactly how these new measures would behave um, in, in, in real time. Um, the final thing I'll say, the other, the other two elements um, of the framework that we adopted pertain to central clearing, banks' exposures to central counterparties, the margin requirements for non-centrally cleared um, derivatives. These, um, these were very consistent with the G20 call to, to move towards uh, G20. So I think in the aggregate, all of these measures together really have made for a, a, a much better, uh, far more um, well-informed regulatory framework. Thanks, Bill. That's really fascinating. You know, from my perspective, having you know been on the other side of the table uh, during the uh, formulation and implementation of these rules, um, as you say, um, it was not a, a straight path. It was uh, at times very, very difficult, and uh, a lot of uh, very interesting engagement uh, between practitioners and regulators as uh, as the framework came together. From where you sit today, uh, we're in uh, twenty twenty one now. Um, are you able to say mission accomplished relative to the broader uh, framework? Work that uh, you all set out to achieve uh, uh, back in 2010? I think it's too soon to say that. Um, I think undoubtedly the, uh, the framework is better. The banking systems around the world uh, are stronger. I think, I think the experience that we've had with COVID so far and the, um, the, the <clears throat> pressure we had uh, we'd seen in the markets last year and the, the considerable pressure on bank asset quality um, from the, the fallout from the pandemic. I, I think that was a, a really good test case. I don't think it was a complete validation. Keep in mind, a lot of these uh, provisions of the Basel III framework are not fully uh, implemented. <clears throat> but I think what we've seen so far, um, I'm encouraged, and I, I think things are mo definitely moving in the right direction. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree. And uh, with the latest implementation of uh, the UMR rules, uh, I think the, the, latest, the, the latest, uh, the last wave actually came into effect uh, this month. Um, is um, actually, uh, again, you know, very much uh, goes to your point about this is still uh, a process that is, uh, that is unfolding before us. Um, I think that leads to an interesting uh, question because even as we're really, as you say, waiting to maybe, uh, you, know, you know, declare a victory in the broader regulatory space, there's a new process that is starting that is very much focused on the, uh, on the digital asset, on the crypto asset, uh, crypto asset uh, uh, space. And um, I guess my first question to you in this regard is whether you see this uh, as a natural progression of the regulatory framework that you focused on during your tenure uh, at the committee. Yeah, Jerome, the role of crypto assets and um, digital assets, it's not, you know, I, I know the Basel Committee just published um, a consultative paper a few months ago, but this is something that we had discussed. Um, well, I, I took the reins of the Basel Committee in 2014, and part of, um, part of my responsibilities as, as the Secretary General was to chair a group called the, um, the Policy Development Group. And the treatment of crypto assets was something we had discussed back then, 2014, 2015. This was this is not a new topic. And I'll state the obvious: it, it, it's imperative for regulators uh, to keep up with the times, to have a high awareness of evolving or growing risks and bank practices, as well as market development. So, so this is this is not something that the Basel Committee just picked up um, recently, or or national authorities. Uh, just started to think about this is uh, this has got a, a kind of a long fuse, um, but you know for emerging or evolving issues like crypto assets, the the regulatory community has to really toe a, a careful line. A too heavy-handed approach could squash a really important and a growing asset class. Too light of a touch could lead to um, really high growth in that asset class and potential financial instability or, or market instability. So yeah, I think the, the Basel Committee's approach um, that it was that it published in its consultative paper and 
I, I think it, it really tries to strike that balance. And this, this is very much a work in progress. Yeah. It seems that um, actually in the paper, um, it's interesting. I think that um, you know they are trying to, or they are taking steps in terms of uh, trying to strike that balance. Uh, perhaps one of the first signs of that is the very clear distinction that the paper uh, uh, defines between crypto assets and digitized assets. So assets using crypto cryptography as opposed to those digitized assets that don't. Um, is this a necessary distinction? Do you think that this is the right way to be wading into this particular pond? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I remember well the, uh, the great sensitivity in the central banking community. R remember the, the Basel Committee is housed uh, within the Bank for Inter International Settlements, the Central Bank for Central Banks. And the whole notion of um, products like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum's product, uh, Ether, the whole notion of this is a currency um, is is um, a very sensitive point for the central banking community, um, and and I think you see that distinction within the paper yeah. that um, the the treatment for those kinds of you know, for Bitcoin, Ether, and the other um, uh, crypto assets. Well, the view within the um, the official sector community, the central banking community, is that um, you know there's there's tremendous volatility. Um, Around these products, uh, there's not a you know they're immature asset classes. There's not a lot of experience. There's no guarantee. They're not issued by a central authority. So, in other words, Jerome, they, they don't meet the, the the true test of a um, uh, of a currency, and that's why central bankers will will always refer to them as crypto assets, not a cryptocurrency. On the other hand, tokenized um, digital products, you know, th th there's a clear link um, to to the underlying assets, and that's why. The, the distinction made by the policy committee is, is uh, in my view, an important one. Um, and that's why uh, I do think they, they're they trying to strike that balance. Uh, much of what has been picked up in the press about this consultation that the policy committee is, uh, is conducting is that it's, um, it's a, a really punitive um, proposed treatment. But that that's just looking at the Bitcoin ether part of it. Uh, I, I think for, for me, the really important takeaway is uh, the acknowledgement by the Basel Committee um, of blockchain, of, of uh, technologies like distributed ledgers. Because there, I think there was a, a clear recognition that um, you know this is we've we've evolved um, in the financial system. We uh, there's got to be an awareness, uh, recognition uh, of these technologies, and I think that consultation paper really does provide that that recognition. Absolutely, it does. And I think it's a very interesting question as well, because these technologies, whether you're talking about distributed ledgers or blockchain, um, these are relatively novel technologies uh, and new entrants into the way uh, various market uh, participants actually communicate amongst each other. Um, it seems that um, you know the, uh, the, the consultation paper uh, also is taking a view as to how to you consider um, these new networks, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, as way, from uh, this way, is this important? You know, uh, Jer Jerome, um, I, I think there's always been a sensitivity within the the central banking, the regulatory uh, community about um, that sector's ability to to keep up to date on technology, uh, innovation, latest developments. You think about um, central bank digital currencies. Um, I, I think there is this, this really keen, this eagerness, this keen awareness that uh, it is imperative that um, policymakers and standard setters are, um, are keeping up to date with the latest technologies. Um, I, I think there's no way the central banking community or the regulatory community could ever outpace the private sector. Yeah. But uh, at best they can, uh, the best they could hope for is to remain current on latest developments, and and I, I I am confident that they that they are. I, I follow what happens at uh, you know the central banks around the world. My 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 former employer, the, the BIS, and um, I, I think in, in some cases um, I, I would say they're even outpacing um, the um, the private sector. So it, I, I could tell you it is a it really is an imperative felt by the uh, the regulatory community to to remain up to date. Uh, and if possible, to to even get ahead of the curve. Yeah. And, and let me just add, you know, sure. if you think about it, um, 
you think about um, prudential rules, we apply those on a bank by bank basis. And if, um, you know, if a bank runs into trouble and it experiences some kind of uh, pressure, well, there, there could be a knock on effect. And worst case scenario is that it leads to um, there's contagion. But if you think about market infrastructure, the volumes are, are you know, orders of magnitude higher than uh, on a bank by bank basis. So if, uh, if a payment system has a, a hiccup, well, that, that reverberates around the rest of the, uh, the financial system. So I think you, it's important to make a distinction. You've got um, the use of technology uh, at the bank level, but then the use of technology um, for market infrastructures, it, it's, it's, it's consistent that you know, regulators want to stay up to date um, with current developments or even get ahead of the curve. But the, the, um, the risks, uh, let me just say the stakes are higher when it comes to market infrastructure. So I, I think there is a, an important distinction there. So are you saying then that you think that there should be additional requirements from a regulatory view uh, with respect to these uh, emerging technologies? I don't think there should be different different rules. I I, um, I just think that they um, take a slightly different approach. If you're a policymaker um, uh, preparing rules for banks versus policymakers who have um, oversight um, over market infrastructure, um, the common thread, of course, is market stability, financial stability. Um, but the stakes are higher um, in uh, you know, there's there's just this this keen awareness that we have to use technology, we have to embrace technology, we have to keep up with the times. But uh, I think there is also at the same time a a, a real awareness that uh, the stakes are are quite high. Indeed, they are. Uh, Bill, we're almost out of time, and I just wanted to ask you one final question, if I could. Um, and that is really, um, if there's any one particular takeaway that you'd like to leave us with, um, you know, relative to either your experience or what you anticipate uh, to be, I guess, the major themes over the next uh, few years in terms of the evolution of the regulatory uh, uh, infrastructure for markets, what would they be? Um, in a word, innovation. <laughs> I think, um, you know, this is, this is my theme Today, I, you know, we've touched on developments where, where we were the global financial crisis, um, where we are today. And uh, looking ahead, um, I, I just sense uh, I'm well aware of this this eagerness in the regulatory community to to continue to embrace technological advances uh, and, and innovation. Um, we are we regulators uh, are keenly aware of the rapid pace of change and doing what they can to remain current and to not serve as a roadblock to the uh, benefits conferred by, um, by innovations and these advances. That, that, that there's a real, um, a real mindset there that, um, that wants to follow through on, on, on embracing technology and, uh, and innovation. So um, I think as, as technology continues to evolve, um, as will innovation, I think the regulatory community uh, is, is keen to embrace that technology, uh, that uh, those advances uh, from uh, from innovation. So uh, it, it, it continues to be an exciting time, and uh, I don't see this pace of change slowing down. And I, I really very much see the regulatory community um, uh, continuing to uh, immerse itself in, in these changes. That's great to hear, and uh, you know clearly from where I sit at Baton, uh, we're you know a major driver of innovation in the settlement space, and uh, we're we're very excited about uh, working more closely with uh, with uh, the regulatory community as well as with our clients to uh, you know drive the adoption of uh, of what we think result in uh, in more robust markets for everyone. Bill, thanks very much for joining us today, and uh, hope to be seeing you again soon. My pleasure, Jerome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. First, I'd like to introduce Baton's core liquidity solution. In essence, this is based around a set of wallets that are used to share an underlying cash account with a Nostro bank, allowing for real-time frictionless movements of cash. First, let me tell you what it isn't. It isn't blockchain. It isn't stablecoin. It isn't tokenization. 
Put simply, it's addressing old money problems with the best in new shared ledger technology. With core liquidity, asset ownership can be transferred in real time and on demand 24 seven in a legally enforceable way. In essence, it delivers programmable money onto existing rails. For large financial institutions, internal fund transfers make up a huge proportion of total movements. Within these organizations, each entity will generally maintain its own nostro in each currency. But transfers between entities are often time consuming, hard to synchronize and expensive. It's challenging to maintain and track liquidity and firms often find themselves crossing large spreads on interest payments and charges when at an overall level, they're sufficiently funded to avoid this. It works like this. We deploy our shared permissioned ledger and smart workflows at the bank where you hold your Nostro accounts. The workflows can be used to optimize the netting and sequencing of internal cash movements to match your binding constraints, while the bat on ledger reflects the allocation of asset ownership across a range of sub-accounts or wallets. Changes of ownership are then driven through the bat on workflows according to the configuration and instructions that you determine. They're completely flexible and enforced by a robust rulebook ensuring irreversibility and enabling you to achieve settlement finality. What does this mean? Well, first of all, it means huge improvements in the use of liquidity at the firm level reflected through lower funding and capital costs. It means that you have real-time reporting and control over the movement of funds between your affiliates. It allows you to reduce the operational and third-party costs associated with internal cash transfers, and you can systematically deploy a new set of payment functions that simply wouldn't be possible with your existing technology. Let's have a look at the product. Here we have three affiliated entities that are holding cash in four different currency-specific accounts. The ownership of these assets is reflected in the digital wallets held by each of these entities on the Baton Ledger. The whole process is governed by a rulebook to provide legal certainty. At the top of the screen, we can view the wallet balance for each participant in the shared account. Each participant is generally a separate node on the Baton Shared Permissioned Ledger, which ensures data confidentiality and control. In the lower portion of the screen, we have a detailed view of each individual ledger entry with an exact timestamp of each ownership change and a reflection of the opening and closing balance of the wallets in question. Let's now imagine that party A needs to pay 25 million euros to party B. Before we do this, take a note of the current euro balances at the omnibus level and for each of the two parties. You can now see that the balances for the two parties have changed immediately and simultaneously although the overall balance in the shared Nostro has not. You can also see in the transaction summary the full details of the transaction with a timestamp that is consistent for both of the participating entities. Here we can see a representation of the wallet structure within each shared Nostro account with one-way transfers and PVP settlements being activated and registered in real time. Other payment processes like automated payment on payment and automated split payments can be configured as required. Each of the participating entities can fund or defund the shared nostros to meet their own obligations as they see fit. A funding transaction will be initiated using conventional payment rails before passing through into the digital layer as the assets are represented within the wallets in the Baton ledger. These instructions can be generated using Baton's configurable smart workflows based on a complete and real-time view of outstanding obligations and available funds across multiple locations. Jerome, I'd like to ask you a question here. During your own banking career, you will have faced firsthand some of the challenges um, of managing liquidity and having liquidity managed for you across a number of different legal entities, liquidity and size. Uh, can I ask you, what observations do you have from your own experience, or perhaps what are you hearing from the people that we're speaking with on this subject? There are numerous ways to reply to you, Alex, uh, but I think I'd sum, it up, I'd sum it up like this. The inability to quickly understand outstanding obligations in real time and to frictionlessly move assets around to optimize the sequencing of inflows and outflows is a source of massive cost to most businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Jerome, thank you for that. If there's one thing you'd like the audience to take away from this, what would it be? This impacts nearly all of the larger banks. So if I would say anything, it would be don't wait. This is a real solution that can revolutionize your liquidity management and deliver some of the huge benefits in economics that distributed ledger technology has promised for years. Now. Absolutely, Jerome. Thank you for that.
Let's look at Baton's core payments. With core payments, we've developed a solution which uses business-defined rules to give you complete control over your payments and settlements across business silos. This means that a payment won't be made simply because of its position in a queue, but because the intelligence signifies it's the right time to do so. One of the challenges many firms face is that their operations functions don't have anything like real-time visibility into their settlement exposures at a counterparty level. For example, it seems absurd that in 2021, payments might continue to be made in ignorance to a counterparty that has failed to meet its own obligations. But this is the reality, which is a consequence of the legacy processes that are still in use across the street. With core payments, we give you a suite of tools which transforms your settlements and payments processes without imposing new technology onto your counterparties or customers. It starts by automating and simplifying the process of agreeing netted settlement amounts. This reduces operational pressure and the risk of errors. We automatically reconcile inbound payments as they are received. This allows a calculation of real-time settlement risk exposure, as well as a clear view of current and forecast funding requirements at the currency level. Using this real-time data, our smart workflows automatically hold or release payments based on your choice of configurations. On a practical level, the solution is highly scalable and can be integrated seamlessly and non-intrusively with your legacy systems and processes. So implementation is a quick and easy process. We've done the work so you don't have to. What's the benefit? Well, first and foremost, you can avoid ever breaching limits or paying against a failing counterparty. You can manage your nostrils much more effectively with a level of control that means you avoid expensive overdrafts or failed settlements. And you can do all of this with reduced manual input, which means an in overall increase in efficiency and productivity. Let's see how it works. A process that almost all banks struggle with is the agreement of netted settlement values with counterparties. In some cases, this forces bank to continue settling gross when that's really not the optimal choice, just to avoid the headache and interventions associated with netting. Our pre-settlement matching module allows you to net transactions using different rules that are consistent with the approach that your different counterparties take. This is a solution that can operate across multiple business silos, allowing for the easy netting of a variety of different obligation types. We then integrate with the processes that you already use to communicate with your counterparties. These might include email, Swift, or other third-party tools. Where you are sending out the pre-settlement values, Baton can automatically populate and send the message, and then consume an acceptance message. Where your counterpart is sending values to you, Baton can consume these and compare them with the specific netting rules you've configured and provide acceptance. Of course, if there isn't a match, then your teams can manage the exceptions. The Settlement Monitor provides a real-time update of the status of incoming and outgoing payments, pulling together data on outstanding settlements alongside Nostro account activity, and presenting all of this information in a consolidated manner. It also calculates real-time settlement risk exposures for each counterparty and references these against your own risk limits. The real-time reconciliation of inbound settlements uses unique reference IDs to ensure that each receipt is correctly allocated. This will revolutionize your reconciliation process. You can say goodbye to the laborious process of next day reconciliation. Now you can have the control and visibility that you've always wanted. Configurable rules running in the background provide an even greater degree of control as they check whether the release of each outbound payment would result in a breach of the relevant limit. If so, then the system automatically holds the instruction until an appropriate inbound payment is received. Where exception approvals are required, configurable workflows provide the approver with complete and real-time information that they need, and it retains a full audit trail on the approval or denial of that payment request. The Liquidity Tracker module uses the same real-time information feeds, but views the data through the lens of liquidity by currency and by Nostra account. Through the combination of real-time visibility and the configurable rules, it allows you to take greater control of your Nostro funding, reducing the risk of accidental overdrafts or failed payments, but without the need to maintain outsized expensive buffers. Payment rules can be set up to control outbound payments. High value payment seats can be flagged for special attention, which can be especially helpful for the less liquid currencies. A rule that some of our customers like to use enables them to link a high value outbound payment with an offsetting inbound receipt even if it's from a different counterparty. You can also set the system to split payments automatically by currency and by counterparty. Liquidity managers can access counterparty level information in the settlement monitor module that we showed before. This allows them to identify which counterparties are responsible for the largest inbound payments and then to review their historic performance for similar settlements. 
Jerome, this is a subject that's incredibly close to my own heart, but I'm interested to hear what you think and what you're hearing from your peers around the industry. Well, Alex, I'm hearing a lot of angst, actually, and I think that banks need to be all over this. The risks of paying out to a counterparty that is already failing or breaching limits or failing settlements are real. Relying on teams usually sitting in outsourced locations to hopefully catch outliers or potential fails across a large client base is really suboptimal. And if you get this wrong, the repercussions aren't only financial, the reputational and regulatory implications can be staggering. An inability to dynamically manage this aspect of payments is a massive blind spot for numerous banks and other market participants. Luckily, Baton offers an intuitive, intelligent, and secure way to help its partners to get a lot smarter about managing what goes out the door for a broad range of product silos. Thanks, Jerome. I think that's absolutely spot on. So let's take a look at Baton's core FX. This is a solution that really excites me. It's going to completely revolutionize the world of FX settlement, giving all market participants a fast and secure platform for the safe settlement of their FX trades. Baton's core FX is all about collaborative, fast and secure post-trade processing, all the way from matching through to settlement using Baton's shared workflows and ledger. It allows you to safely settle with your counterparties when you want to cutting back on complexity and lets you use flexible and automated netting and payment strategies. Your entire settlement cycle can be completed in just a few minutes. Why is all this important? Well, post-trade FX processes have remained virtually unchanged for the last 20 years or so, whilst volumes have skyrocketed and yields have been driven down, especially through the mass adoption of multi-bank execution platforms. I think most would agree that the existing post-trade processes are just no longer fit for purpose. Not only that, but in recent years, regulators and other industry bodies have expressed an increased level of concern about settlement risk. This was highlighted again in the recent revisions to the global code. And aside from all of this, intraday funding costs at major banks are very much under the microscope, and they're dominated by FX. They need to be managed down. So what's special about CoreFX? Well, CoreFX is for real money held in real accounts at commercial banks, so it can be used for all currencies, not just a select few. To be clear, we don't rely on the tokenization or digitization of assets. It's backed by a rule book so you can benefit from the latest decentralized technology alongside the certainty of a defined governance process with settlement finality. Importantly, CoreFX is system agnostic and unintrusive. There's no need to rip out and replace your existing infrastructure. It integrates seamlessly with the core ledgers, payment gateways, and messaging systems already in place. It uses secure access protocols, adapters, and APIs. And the benefits? Well, safer settlements. CoreFX allows for zero friction and collaborative and configurable settlements, which can be affected when you want, so that you have almost immediate access to the funds you're due to receive. So this provides the opportunity to radically reduce settlement risk and liquidity usage. One of our existing customers talks about TWA, transparency, workflow, and auditability. Let's look at the solution in more detail. In this view, I'm counterparty A. I'm looking at my transactions against parties B and C. I could apply filters by counterparty, currency and value date, as well as trade or settlement status. Importantly, what I see is what my counterparties see. That's the beauty of the shared ledger. CoreFX can represent three versions of each transaction. The golden copy, which can be generated by a third party platform or through Baton, and the version of the trade that each of the two counterparties has booked in its own risk systems. In this case, they all match, as indicated by the green equals sign on the left-hand side of the screen. By default, these trades are continuously netted for each combination of currency pair, value date, and counterparty. Of course, the netting process is identical for each counterparty as we're using a shared ledger. On or occasionally before value date, netting groups will be confirmed, meaning that the population of trades and the netted values are set. Remember, both parties are using the same shared data and shared workflows. There's no need to run old-style reconciliations or manual processes to agree these values. The process of confirming a netting group is generally automated by mutually agreed rules based around time or notional value. We can look at that in more detail in a second. Once the netting group is confirmed, it drops down into the lower part of this screen and the settlement process can begin. Let's look at the second line in the confirmed netting groups. We can see that it's between party A and party B, that it comprises 49 trades, that settlement has been completed, that the process was governed by a workflow event, and that there were five shapes used for the full settlement process. 
In a second, we can drill into some of the workflow rules that we use to process this settlement, but for now, I want to focus on the actual settlement itself. Clicking into the settlement, we can see the underlying shapes. It's quite common for firms to want to split settlements into short, smaller shapes, but without a shared workflow and shared ledger, this often results in a high degree of communication and challenges around reconciliation. In this instance, the nodes that are part of the settlement process have full, real-time and shared information on the intention and the progress. If we now click into the actual process, we can see how CoreFX allows for the elimination of settlement risk by simultaneously changing ownership of the currencies using shared settlement accounts at commercial banks. Here we can see on the top line, money being transferred, sterling being transferred from party B uh, into the shared settlement account, euro being transferred from party A also into the shared settlement account. There's a timestamp against each of those two movements. It's only when both of those funds have moved that the ownership can take place, the ownership change can take place. Uh, and we see that marked in the middle in the black text um, happening with a specific timestamp that is of course shared by both counterparties. Once that ownership has changed and the funds haven't yet moved, uh, the funds can be moved from the shared settlement account into the destination nostros for each of the parties. So in this case, you see the euros being moved to party B's account and the sterling being moved to party's A account. And all of that takes place consistently within a three minute window. Taking a step back, let's explore how we set up these smart workflows. Each settling party operates as a node within CoreFX. Each node operates on a secure, single tenant cloud infrastructure, so there's no risk of data pollution. The node profile can be set up to use a number of rules, including standing settlement instructions, as on this screen. As we saw earlier, scheduled settlement runs can be agreed between two counterparties. Commonly, our users will choose to arrange two or three settlement runs per day, per currency pair, at whatever time proves optimal for them, so it suits their broader funding requirements. The euro sterling settlement that we looked at just now was run as a workflow event at 1330 UTC based on the configuration that you can see here. An additional tool for managing liquidity is the ability to set up rules that automatically split settlements into values of a maximum size. This can be specific to each currency and each counterparty. In this case, I want to draw your attention to the 15 million euro limit that's been set by Bank A which is what caused the 65 million euro settlement that we just looked at to be automatically split into five equal shapes of 13 million euros. Jerome, this isn't a solution that's about small gains. This is transforming the way that FX participants settle their trades. And let's face it, this is a transformation that's long overdue. Amen, Alex. Just think about this. Large banks face multiple challenges when it comes to settling their FX trades across the multitude of clients, counterparties, and currencies they encounter on a daily basis. While CLS is able to offer PVP settlement to its 78 members and 18 eligible currencies, on any given day, there are 25 to 30,000 clients of CLS members and a raft of ineligible currencies in the market, translating to $8.9 trillion of risk outside of the CLS perimeter. CoreFX radically changes this paradigm. And what I love about it, you know, Jerome, is the fact that it does so whilst allowing banks to preserve their intraday liquidity by reducing the emphasis on a single point of concentration around liquidity usage. So, Jerome, planning for 2022, many firms have started that process. Uh, I'm hearing people talking about meetings they're having, budgets they're putting together. Thankfully, many of those conversations, and most of them now, are not about seating plans, working from home rotors, uh, Zoom call bills, things of that sort of nature. So as we move away from COVID, what do you think are the topics that people should be really thinking about now as they plan for the year ahead? Yeah, it's going to be a really exciting planning process this year, Alex, because it I would say that it's the first time since 2019 where we can really start to engage in very forward-looking solutions for the first time that will impact significantly uh, the way we interact with markets, the way our clients interact with markets, the way markets interact with their clients. Um, and I think it boils down to a number of uh, key themes that we ourselves have been discussing on, uh, on this uh, show today. The reduction of settlement risk, the optimization of funding and, and liquidity, and the ability to actually take control of the settlement cycle. This is something that, by and large, clients don't realize they can do today. 
And uh, by leveraging the technology that Bataan is, has in production today, they're able to do that for the first time. So if anything, I would say to our clients, while you're thinking about these solutions that you're going to be implementing, be bold, be bold. I think that's right. I think leadership is the key here. And certainly the conversations that I'm having with our clients, they would, they would echo, I think, what you're saying. We're seeing people being bold and really thinking carefully about the future. Jerome, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's time to wrap up this Pay21 show. Many thanks to you for joining. And thanks also to Bill Cohen, Arjun Jayaram, and Jerome Kemp for their contributions to the show. At the risk of repeating myself, legacy systems and processes don't need or deserve to be protected. The technology is available and proven to allow you to radically transform your business and to do it quickly. If there's anything you've seen through this show that you want to talk about further, please reach out. We're proud of what we do and we'd be happy to share it with you in more detail. Thank you.